From Photonics Media, this is All Things Photonics, a podcast where we explore industry-shaping advancements in lasers, optics, imaging, metrology, and sensing. Each episode, we'll speak with some of the brightest minds in industry and research about the trends shaping the landscape of photonics. Today's episode is brought to you by Hamamatsu Corporation, a leading manufacturer of devices for the generation and measurement of infrared, visible, UV light, and x-rays. Hamamatsu is dedicated to the advancement of photonics through extensive research and offers specialized systems for select applications. Visit hamamatsu.com to learn more. Data centers have provided massive opportunities for the development of the internet, social media, and cloud storage. Advancements in memory and processing have enabled these opportunities to develop into billion-dollar industries. While these technological advancements have largely kept pace with the demands of these applications, there's another opportunity that's taking shape, maybe better described as a fledgling market, artificial intelligence, and in particular, generative AI models like ChatGPT and DeepSeek are incredibly demanding, both in terms of power consumption and data consumption. As they stood before the rise of generative AI applications, data centers were already becoming a bit of a problem. The sheer amount of power required to operate these data centers is staggering. According to the US Department of Energy, a data center can consume up to 50 times the energy of a typical commercial office building of the same size. In the United States, these spaces collectively account for about 2% of the total electricity consumption nationwide. Optical networking technologies have emerged as a potential solution to not only meet the increased demands of data centers in terms of bandwidth, but as a way to significantly reduce the amount of energy required to deliver information from place to place. On All Things Photonics, we've had a number of guests discuss optical networking technologies, but seldom do we consider the role of materials. In this episode, we'll speak with Brad Booth, CEO of NLM Photonics. Backed by partnerships with names like IMEC, Hamamatsu, AIM Photonics, CEA Letty, and others, NLM Photonics is the developer of a hybrid electro-optic technology that combines high-performance organic materials with semiconductor photonics. In this conversation, we'll cover the role of those materials in delivering the promises of optical networking, some recent research advances, in what the coming years may hold for the company. Up next, our conversation with Brad Booth of NLM Photonics. Uh, I'd like to start with a quick overview of NLM's hybrid electro-optic technology platform. Uh, you know, what is this technology used for? How does it differentiate itself from competing platforms? And uh, how do materials factor into that equation? Yeah, so NLM uh, does a hybrid organic electro-optical material. We actually have a number of materials that we we create, uh, some that are used in uh, quantum applications. That way they can handle cryogenic temperatures. Some that we provide to research foundations. Uh, They don't have high thermal stability. You know, typically you're not pushing them to high temperatures, manufactured temperatures type stuff. And then we have a Another material, uh, our Celeriton, Celerion <laughs> HTX, uh, that material we use uh, for commercial applications. Uh, those are the ones that have to go through high volume manufacturing. Uh, and what our material does is we can change the properties of what are traditional modulators used in the industry to make them what's called a Packles effect modulator. And the reason why this is important is it's a very highly responsive device. Uh, so it doesn't take a lot of extra energy uh, to modulate the light. Uh, and the nice thing is, is you get a very quick response in modulating the light. So if you look at traditional technologies today, uh, the challenge typically comes across that if you're using silicon photonics, you're using a uh, um, they're using devices or a medium materials that weren't really designed for light. Um, silicon photonics basically took CMOS circuitry, what was used in electronics, and figured out, hey, we can pass light through this. Um, that design 
has a lot of challenges because it's not really designed for light. It's cheap and it's cost effective and you can do it, but you're basically pushing, you know, a rock up a hill. Uh, and what we do is we take that boulder away and say, hey, let's start at the top of the hill and work our way down. Uh, so by imparting our material into those devices, making those devices smaller, because you don't need as big a device anymore, you can make that device significantly smaller, which gives you uh, area savings on your wafer, which gives you lower cost. And then you can also, because it's smaller uh, in size, you can go to higher frequencies and by imparting our material, because it's so responsive, it becomes very energy efficient. You don't actually have to overdrive the circuit to make it work. And that's a, a big part of what is happening for NLM is, is transitioning from what was uh, science and experiment over a large number of years. So the technology concept has been around for over 25 years. The big difference is, is that about six years ago, the founders of NLM Photonics realized that we could make this material thermally stable. And that's a, a critical value for our industry. Uh, in our industry, there's, there's really three power envelopes that you have to meet. The minimum one is a Talcoria spec, where you have to at least be able to go to 85 degrees C. The next one is actually when you integrate electronics and optics, uh, a lot of people refer that to uh, to that as a JDEX spec. Others refer to it as, you know, you've got to be able to satisfy 125 degrees C, which is case temperature for a standard silicon circuit. Uh, the other one is the temperature that kicks in in manufacturing of these devices. And that temperature is typically anywhere between 250 and 270 degrees C. That is what they call reflow temperature. So if they took our circuit and they put it on a device, but decided that that what circuit wasn't working and they wanted to replace it, they need to be able to heat that device up for a very short period of time to liquefy the solder and take the device off and put a new one on. Uh, and that was the biggest challenge is being able to handle those temperatures. And, and that's where NLM actually has a significant benefit is our, our HTX material can actually go to those temperatures. Now, what does this technology mean for applications like artificial intelligence and uh, quantum computing? Yeah, those two markets are actually um, radically different, actually, even though they, right. you know, people sure. are kind of put them in a similar bucket. So quantum is still a lot of area of research going on on people wanting to figure out how to do that. And we actually have a customer in the quantum space. The challenge for most uh, photonics in quantum applications is the cryogenic temperatures. Um, right. That's not a challenge for the organic materials. That's actually a, a benefit to the organic materials. They prefer things colder than hot. Um, but because the circuits become so responsive, it's actually very beneficial. So if you look at... Uh, most of the materials used in quantum applications today, they are typically Pockel's effect materials, whether it be barium titanate, thin film lithium niobate, or organic materials. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's challenges and benefits to all of these. Um, you know, one of the aspects that I really like about what we're bringing to this is you can do this with standard silicon photonics designs or silicon nitride designs for that matter, uh, and in part our material, your device, your device size stays very small. It actually shrinks. Um, a lot of these other Pockels effect material actually have very large modulators, uh, especially thin film lithium niobate. Their modulators are all 10 times at least larger than ours. Um, so it depends. In some applications, you don't care about size, but if you're trying to integrate more with many of these systems, size can become relative. Um, where size really kicks in is in cost, right? The smaller the device, sure. the more you get per wafer, the lower the cost. So that's one of the benefits we see in quantum. Uh, in artificial intelligence, uh, the application there that's becoming very 
challenging is the power consumption. Uh, yeah. if we did, you know, some back of the cuff calculations on a full AI scale data center. Uh, you know, whether you're looking at a Stargate where someone said, Hey, I'm going to just build a big AI data center. Uh, the challenge is, is that anywhere between 30 to 50% of the power for that data center, uh, goes towards networking and within the networking aspects of that data center, about 70% of the power relative to networking goes towards the optics. Uh, so anytime you can see power savings there is pretty significant because our technology actually improves uh, the power savings as you go faster. One of the things we're seeing is anywhere from 30 to 50% power savings in a standard transceiver. Uh, so that 30 to 50% at 200 gig per wavelength Overall, in a data center, an AI data center can equal anywhere up to you know ten to twelve percent of the data center's power just being saved by using our material in either a silicon photonics platform or potentially even in an indium phosphide platform. Today's episode is brought to you by Lightpath Technologies. From concept through prototyping, volume production, and global distribution, LightPath has the optical and infrared imaging knowledge and manufacturing expertise to be your optics and thermal imaging solutions partner every step of the way. Visit lightpath.com to learn more. One of your more recent scientific publications describes the first silicon organic hybrid electro-optic modulator uh, based on a long-term stable cross-linked electro-optic material. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that work uh, and its significance? Yeah. So this is one of the critical elements of actually how our, our uh, thermally stable uh, material works. So within the industry, most of the, most of the what they call electro-optical polymers, uh, materials that are used that are out there, uh, they get pulled but they don't get cross-linked. And so we like to say, okay, if, you, if you're if you not cross-linked, typically we refer to that as a, a thermoplastic. Um, think of it as being like that plastic dish you put in the microwave and it melts, right? It At high temperatures, it has some fluidity, uh, which is challenging when you're trying to manufacture and put it in high volume manufacturing. Uh, ours, by cross-linking, we create a very strong bond within that material, and that becomes a thermoset plastic, which is similar to the plastic devices that you put in microwaves, but don't melt. <laughs> you right. know, so there, that's the the kind of subtle differences. The beauty is, is that by being able to handle those high temperatures, it means that we don't have to interrupt the manufacturing flow that people are used to using. So you follow the standard manufacturing process for the photonic device, for the photonic integrated circuit, then what we do is we intercept it at the back end, in a sense. We call it the back end, back end of line. Uh, it, and what we do is at that point in time, we impart our material, we encapsulate it, and then we cross-link and pull it at the same step, and then it becomes thermal set. And that, that device then you can go through solder reflow and, and do these other manufacturing steps that are much more mechanical. They're outside of the typical uh, silicon manufacturing or wafer manufacturing. Now you're dealing with temperatures that show up in the packaging realm, which are typically much lower. NLM seems to be picking up a bit of steam lately. Uh, you know, In the last few years, you guys have gotten contracts with NASA and AFWorks. Uh, published some papers uh, and seen uh, investments from some you know pretty big names like Hamamatsu, uh, the NSF, and the DOE. Uh, now, what do the next couple of years uh, look like for the company? Uh, the next couple of years are are actually going to be uh, very interesting for us in the sense that what we're working on now is uh, building an ecosystem for manufacturing of these devices. Our long term goal. Uh, with our technology is to make it ubiquitous in the industry. Uh, as a small company, a small startup, uh, having 
previously worked for guys like Microsoft and Meta and stuff, so you realize that a small startup is not going to be a supplier to these big companies. They're not going to, you know, roll eye on you to be the high volume manufacturer for them. Um, if we wanted to proceed down that path, that'd be a completely different investment profile for us. But what we can do with our technology and with our partners that we that we're working with and that we're growing uh, is get in to the manufacturing flow so that if a hyperscaler comes along and says, I think I need something that, you know, I heard about this technology from NLM and I want it incorporated. I want to use a silicon organic hybrid device in my, in my data center, that whole supply chain is ready for them. And so that's a lot of what we're working on is working with our partners to do that. And that's what we're going to be seeing over the next couple of years is as we progress and continue to make developments, we'll be sharing that with more and more people. Uh, one of the things that we did do recently is we taped out a 1.6 T pick, a photonic integrated circuit that does eight lanes of 200 gig. And it's a silicon photonics based platform. What I find uh, extremely interesting about that device is it does give us a direct correlation of the size. When I say we, we can make these devices smaller, uh, that device in using our technology is 50% smaller than a similar device done in standard silicon photonics without any of our material. Where this becomes very interesting is if you look at a 300 millimeter wafer, what that means is instead of getting 3,000 picks off of it, you get over 5,000 picks off of this. Right. So, you know, if we're looking at things where we're building Stargate size data centers where you need 20 to 30 million optical yeah. transceivers, right. you're going to want more volume. <laughs> certainly, certainly. You know, so getting 200 or 300 off of a small wafer or getting 3,000 off of even a silicon photonics wafer or 5,000, that's a very different equation. I think that's going to be the challenge uh, that we think many people in the industry are going to be listening to is, hey, we can suddenly get a... a volume scale that doesn't traditionally exist with photonics. Uh, you know, traditionally photonics has always stayed at, at limited dimensions. We've never been able to really make them smaller. We've not been able to increase their performance. By now, with the technology NLM is bringing to bear, we increase their performance, we increase their energy efficiency, and we re reduce their size. To me, that's a perfect trifecta for what we're trying to do with you know, going forward in the industry with AI and, and even for content. With that, we conclude another episode of All Things Photonics. Thank you to our sponsors, to the technical staff behind the scenes, and to continued support from the Photonics Media Editorial Team. As always, questions, comments, thoughts, and ideas are welcome. Let us know how we're doing via email at allthings@photonics.com. All Things Photonics is available on all major platforms and on our website, photonics.com.